Thank you. Thanks very much. And finally, um, how are you doing then? All right. Brilliant. It's great to be back at the Lowry. It's actually 10 years since I did a gig here when it first opened. And I remember my agent saying at the time, she said, Paul, play your cards right. And if you're any good, you know, in a few years' time, I might be able to get you a gig on a Sunday afternoon for free. <laughs> where you follow a gold medalist, a man that can kill with his bare hands, and a bloke playing tunes on a walk. <laughs> at the time, it just seemed like a dream. Uh, but uh, for those of you that don't know, I, I'm a magician, and it's, it's actually very difficult to say the word magician without going like that, because that's what people do to you. You know, people like, no, they, they go, I, I was the older, you know. And I've got kids that live near me, and because they know what I do, they go past on the school bus and take the mickey, they always lean out and go, ooh, like that. So I've got a little magical gesture I do back, where I go, <laughs> it basically means disappear, kid. Asbo Kadabra. The thing, about, uh, the thing about being a magician is it's, you know, people think it's mainly about sleight of hand, but it's actually a combination more of sort of applied psychology, uh, deception, illusion, misdirection, and bluff, basically, uh, which is why we're talking about airport security. It's much the same thing. Um, and uh, it, it's a way that this, this started a few years ago. People always say to me, Paul, do you only use your powers for good? And the answer's not entirely. Does anybody know how I get those off, by the way? Shame to ruin a good jacket. Um, now the answer is not entirely. And uh, so what I do now, just as a hobby and a bit of kind of like therapy, is I mess about at airports and waste airport security time. Because let's face it, they started it. <laughs> and um, the way they started it for me was a few years ago. I was checking in to, to fly to New York. And the woman behind the counter was just so rude. You know, she was doing the usual questions, but very rude. And so, you know, being British, I, I got a bit sarcastic. Because that's what we're good at, let's face it. And, uh, and she got to the point where she said, did you back pack your bags yourself? And I went, yeah, all by myself, right? <laughs> it's not a great line, as your faces are telling me. However, she kind of tapped this sign that I hadn't noticed behind the counter, and there's a, this sign that actually said, no jokes. <laughs> Cap it seriously like that. And I thought, yeah, you know, so, she carried on being rude. I, I, I was fine, by the way. I carried on, right, and she did all these questions. She got ruder and ruder as she went. And eventually I said to her, why are you being this rude? And she went, it's for security reasons, sir. I said, what, are you being rude for security reasons? And she went, yes, sir. I'm thinking, I wonder how many terrorists that's put off over the past few years. <laughs> well, I was going to do my suicide mission from here, but if you're going to be like that, you know, it's not like that. But it's just become this kind of all-encompassing phrase that now doesn't mean anything. You know, everything's for safety and security reasons. Just every security reasons. It's just that empty. It's, it's like, you know, company policy or I love you. You know, it's just a means to an end. It's, and uh, the, the next thing that kind of wound me up is, is that as I was getting on, I'd fill the, um, you know, the, the Esther thing online, you know, the visa waiver thing, you have to fill in all these daft questions, and then you get on the flight and they still hand you the paper version with the same questions because they haven't got the stuff together yet. And uh, let me just remind you what it actually says on here. If you fly into the States, question B, have you ever been arrested or convicted for an offence or crime involving moral turpitude? <laughs> I don't know. But I quite like the sound of it. It's like moral turpitude, I would imagine, involves wearing like a velvet smoking jacket and a fez. You know, having a cigarette holder and going, 16, you say? <laughs> so, question... Question C. This is my favourite one. This is seriously what it says. Have you ever been, or are you now involved, in espionage or sabotage or terrorist activities or genocide? <laughs> Bit of a loaded question when you're away to Disneyland with the kids, that, isn't it, really, you know? So uh, this is what I did about three years ago. I called the cabin crew back the one there. I said, excuse me, but question C, um, how many people do I have to have killed before it's technically genocide? <laughs> I've been American, she went, I'll just find out, sir. <laughs> Didn't come back. Got off the plane, two guys with guns there. Eight hours later, the rubber gloves out. I'm on my holidays. It was all fine. But, uh, but it's really a security reason. And so, uh, the, the other thing that was wound me up uh, was this whole thing about the liquids. You know, you can't take liquids through unless they're in 100 milliliter bottles, then they've got to be in a plastic bag and all that. So next time, try this, right? Just ask them why they've got to be in a clear plastic bag. And they go, so we can x-ray them. And you go, how crap is your x-ray machine <laughs> that they have to be in a totally transparent bag? That's not an x-ray machine, that's a pair of glasses you've got from a joke shop, isn't it? You know? 
But the, the whole thing about it, it's got to be a certain size, like not more than a litre capacity and all that kind of thing, and a certain fastening, like a Ziploc type thing or whatever. I was behind a woman in a queue a bit ago, and they were taking all the stuff out of what looked like the right bag to me and putting it in another one that looked the same. And so when I got there, I said, well, what was I watching there? I said, oh, it had the wrong kind of fastening. So what do you mean? She said, well, it's supposed to have that, and it had a press stud. You go, well, I'm sure that's made me feel a lot safer that you've talked about now. You know, maybe you're just thinking that all kind of terrorists are like the pantomime villain with the hook, you know. I think you'll find that some of them have actually got opposable thumbs these days, you know. <laughs> but it's all it is, like 100 millilitres, right? And, and uh, you can, if you've got, I've got a bigger bottle and it's clear and you've got a bit of liquid, you can't take it. However, you can take the same big bottle if it's totally empty. That doesn't add up to me. The whole idea is liquid explosives, well, I thought, was that you combine a couple of elements, you know? And uh, so this is kind of, in effect, making your job easier if you've got to separate them to start with in little bottles. Because you can put like four or five, so you've got, say, half a litre of stuff, and people go, ah, but Paul, why are they going to mix that? You need a bigger container. I go, well, how about a litre size clear plastic bag? That would probably do it. <laughs> it's sealable and everything. Just nonsense. And, um, you, you know, you, you, you might be thinking, well, what can you do about it? You know, well, what you can do is dick them about a bit. Now, you know when you get to the x-ray machine, you know those little trays, right? There's generally bigger ones these days, but it used to be these little ones. Um, I nicked 15 of these. <laughs> Seriously, over a couple of years. Um, no real reason, just because I could. That was it, so it's just... Because it's the one bit they're not looking at you. You know, you're walking up to the x-ray machine and you're looking all nervous and they're checking you through the metal detector and all the rest of it. Once your bag's clear, that's the one bit you can do anything like that. You know, strip naked, carry it all out. Um, so um, I got 15 of these at home and nothing to do with them. So in the end, I thought, well, I'll have a little laugh. What I'll do, I got a soldering iron and, uh, and I just engraved my name on the side. And then I started taking them back with me. <laughs> and I just used to quietly slip it in there, you know. And when it came out the far end, I go, thanks very much, have a nice day. And he goes, sorry, can you put that back? I go, why? It's mine. He go, don't be ridiculous. He go, well, it's got my name on it. <laughs> I did, uh, I did, think of, uh, I did think of taking a, a sort of nice hot lasagna. Uh, <laughs> a little bell under my jacket going, ping! Thanks very much. Cheers. But uh, I'll tell you the other thing I, I put through. Um, you know, um, in the pound shop, uh, they sell fake mobile phones these days. You get like iPhone or whatever. Um, and it, it's just it's, it's for kids. To, it just plays noises, you know, like sort of, because ringtones on phones and small children aren't independently irritating enough. You can combine the two <laughs> for the ultimate experience. And uh, I got a few of these and um, I melted them down um, on a baking tray, gas mark five, about 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> so what you end up with is this kind of like limp, sort of knackered, Dali-esque, melted phone, right? So when I go now, I just have one of those in my pocket, and I just quietly slip that in the tray, and when it comes out the far end of the x-ray, you just go, what the hell's happened to that? Ah, <laughs> because <sighs> I can. And um, I've got these as well, these are brilliant. Have a look at these. I know this is all about big ideas, this conference, uh, new ideas, the future, very old idea, very bad idea, very simple. Um, <laughs> that's all they do. But you want a go, don't you? <laughs> I think they do as well, so I always take those two, and you imagine they look great on the x-ray, and they've only got certain pre-programmed questions usually, so they always kind of, uh, you know, sort of pull them out and go, uh, what are they? And I go, There's a slight pause, and the next pre-programmed question, could they be used as a weapon? I suppose if you put your mind to it, they could, you know, could <laughs> tweak someone's nipple really hard, you know, it's like, <laughs> take me to Baghdad, mofo, you know, it's, um, but, uh, what they're they really for these, though, they, I, I bought these in a disabled person's accessory shop, and I can't, for the life of me, think why I was in there, to be honest. <laughs> think I'd had a drink. Uh, but what, um, what they're for is like old or infirm people, uh, you know, bedridden or in a wheelchair to, to pick things up from a distance. And it's a nice idea, you know, so you, imagine that's the thing you want to pick up. It'd be a bit ridiculous, obviously, but you go, right, I'll have some of that. And sure enough, it's a good firm grip and you pick it up, but when you bring it back towards yourself, it opens and lets go. <laughs> What's the point of that? That's the most useless bloody thing ever invented. Oh, I think I'll just have a nice drop smash bugger. No, I won't. Cruel and heartless. But to, to, someone said to me a while back, now what you're meant to do is you're supposed to pick up the thing like that and then bring it in towards yourself. You go, well, if I can do that, my hand's now at the place the object was originally. I could have just picked it up. <laughs> Stupid. But it's like this whole thing about, uh, you know, uh, could it be used as a weapon? You know, well, probably, yes. Yeah, have you got anything that could be used as a weapon? Uh, my fist? Um, 
knowledge of martial arts, uh, you know, uh, intelligence. Um, you know, a belt, they take your belt off you, but then you give it your back. Now, a belt can make a fantastic sort of medieval mace type thing or a knuckle duster with a spike. I've thought about this. <laughs> or a, a CD snapped in half will cut through even the thickest brick red cabin crew makeup. You know, it's like, <laughs> and there's all sorts of things, eventually. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you can use as a weapon. You know, it's, it's got a bit of a daft thing. They've got this thing uh, in the States where, you know, do you know you're allowed to take live ammunition on aircraft as long as it's in a locked box in the hold? Now, you can't take paint or thinners. You can't take explosives, obviously. Uh, you can't take gun caps or any of that sort of thing. But live rounds of ammunition, you can. Right? Now, the reason for that, I think, is because most people who are flying in the States are doing it for leisure, and when they're doing their leisure in the States, they do a lot of shooting. Right? And so if they couldn't take their ammunition or their guns, then they wouldn't go via an airline. And that's be it's basically economics disguised as safety and security, so that kind of thing. Same with the, the, the baggage allowance. You know, uh, the baggage allowance, if you fly to Australia with a certain airline, one suitcase, 20 kilos. Right? If you fly same airline from Australia to America, two suitcases, 24 kilos each. Right, because Americans don't like travelling light. So again, it's this whole kind of like bluff thing, and it's all about money at the end of the day. Same with the liquids. You know, when you queue up outside, you know, and you've got to get rid of all these liquids, the real reason for that, I think, personally, is that, you know, you've spent kind of half an hour in the queue, next time you'll get there a bit earlier, and then you spend two hours airside spending money on liquids that got taken off you before you went through, you know. Uh, and if they were honest about that, you wouldn't mind, you know. It's all bluff. But, you know, the, the, one of my favourite things to do um, is with the metal detector. Uh, and, and you can, you know, feel free to use this, right? Basically, it's a bit of a waste of time, the, the metal detector in my book, because guess what? You know, explosives, not made of metal. Mm. But if you're not careful, someone will invent carbon fibre blades soon. And uh, this thing, I, I've, I've snuck that through a couple of times. Uh, you know, I'd never take that out before the metal detector. It's a little kind of inspection mirror. And uh, what I do is just, oh, what I do is I break it. And... <laughs> No, I basically just sit there in an aisle seat on the plane, and every time the cabin crew walk past, I just kind of like do that. And they go, what do you think you're doing? I go, it's all right, security reasons, love. And because uh, it is that catch-all phrase. So the best thing of all is, before the metal detector, I put something under my shirt that deliberately sets it off, right? That saves a bit of time. Well, I said saves a bit of time. Last time cost me two years. And uh, imagine, right, I've got a microphone, yeah, you know the, the handheld metal detectors they have? Because there's always something that sets the thing off and they get that on you. It's called a security wand, right, the Prince Albert detector, right? And uh, <laughs> imagine, imagine the microphone's one of those. Okay, can we, can we stick that on for a sec? Is that, you want to need to ping, is that? That's cool. So you, you walk through, thing goes off, and they go, okay, sir, can you assume the position? Okay. And they go, what have you got under there? And I go, it's one of them. And then we stand there and look at each other. <laughs> Usually for quite a while. That's some bad remake of a Star Wars scene or something. And eventually they always go, why have you got that? And I go, for security reasons. <laughs> All I'm saying is don't let them confiscate your sense of humour. Thanks a lot.